to continue the propagation of his deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the causer. And then he uses people as tools to carry out whatever the plan or the decree is. And so in every preceding generation of Muslims, there are those people who came before us in time and space and who gave the matter their due diligence. They strove, excuse me, gentlemen. Gentlemen, stop talking. They gave the matter their due diligence. They made sacrifices for the religion. They gave time, they gave wealth, they gave energy, and then they passed on. And uh, we are now, dear brothers and sisters, in that position. We are what they call the khalaf. And there's a dua that the Prophet would make when he would go to the grave site, he would say, he would give salams to the people who were there. So he would say, Assalamu alaikum, da'ara qawmin mu'mineen. Greetings be unto you and to the abode of the believers. And then he would say, Antum as-sabi'un, you are the predecessors. You are the ones who preceded us. You, you did your time here on earth, and you return to Allah, we are the ones who are coming after you. So it is always a good thing for us to pray for uh, the people who Allah used in this city to uh, ensure that we would have Islam. For every masjid in the city of Philadelphia, there are people who sacrifice so that there will be a masjid and musalla, so that the doors will open so that the lights were on, so that the heat was on, so that the building stayed presentable, so that the building was available for the believers. And a lot of times, the only way that we can appreciate that is when we take time to look back, to look back in time, and to realize that were it not for the sacrifices of those who came before us, then we wouldn't have what we have right now today. So we want to express our gratitude to Allah Ta'ala for that. And um, today, inshallah, we are tackling a topic that is quite honestly very, very complex and uh, very deep. And it is a topic that is related to the heart. It's a topic that's related to our personal piety, our taqwa. It's a topic that's related to our capacity to dig deeper than we may normally dig to find within ourselves some of the hidden uh, strengths, some of the hidden treasures, some of the hidden powers that Allah has blessed all of us with. Um, today we're going to talk and say a few words about forgiveness. Uh, what I want to do is I want to speak about forgiveness as it relates to other people and not as it relates to us and Allah. And so we know that we're in the second 10 days of Ramadan, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that the second 10 days of Ramadan are days of forgiveness. They are days during which we are to beseech Allah and ask him to forgive us. And we, we are to do that diligently. And so we're going to, inshallah, towards the end of the talk, I'm going to share with you a prayer that we can say, inshallah, in the hopes that that will happen for us. But um, I wanted to say uh, today some things that relate to forgiveness and uh, be between us and other people. Uh, because in Islam, uh, forgiveness is one of the virtuous deeds. And it has a tremendous propensity to give the person a station. Uh, there's a station in Islam. There are stations in Islam, spiritual stations, that people can ascend to. And one of those stations is the station of mercy, that you 
are a merciful person. The Prophet ﷺ was described by Allah as a merciful person. That he was with the believers, compassionate and merciful. In addition to the spiritual benefit, forgiveness has the propensity to heal the individual and to grant peace to the soul, the heart, and to the mind. Now, as Muslims, we often strive to emulate the example of the Prophet and Allah Ta'ala has, of course, spoken about the excellence of the Prophet's character. And then we find that in his Sunnah, which are represented, or which is represented by the words, the actions, and the consensual practices that have reached us today, there's ample evidence that really calls our attention to the importance of reframing our attitude towards forgiveness, particularly as it relates to other people. And so, inshallah, what I want to do is I want to speak from the Islamic frame in other words, share with you some of the verses from the Qur'an and some of the examples from the hadith of the Prophet um, And that will be probably the most that the time will allow us to uh, engage in. And then I want to mention briefly some of the practical steps. Because uh, one of the things that I want to emphasize very early on is that forgiveness is a process. So it's not something that you do because you say you're going to do it. It's not a statement that you make. It's more than that. It's actually a process. And that process includes um, um, some pain, uh, uh, some confrontation, confronting hurt, and then ultimately releasing. So there's a process of releasing, releasing anger and releasing hurt and so on. And so I don't want to deceive anyone into believing that forgiveness is an easy thing because, in fact, it's quite difficult. Uh, and this is one of the things, and this is the, the verse that I want to use as the framing verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَلَمَنْ صَبَرَ وَغَفَرَ إِنَّ ذَٰلِكَ لَمِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ he says by way of the English translation, and whosoever perseveres and forgives, that, that is the test of the matter. Okay, and I like to use both the Arabic as well as the English, because the Arabic, some of the words that are used are very, very precise. And so when Allah says, sabr, walaman sabara, sabr is perseverance, and ghafara is forgiveness. He puts that combination together because they go together. You can't have forgiveness without perseverance, and you can't have perseverance without forgiveness. And so they rely on one another. Allah says that whoever is blessed to be able to do both of those things in a matter or in a situation that is the test. That is the most difficult of things to do. Inna dhalika la min azm. He used the word azm. And the word azm means something that is extremely uh, difficult. Extremely difficult. So it's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing to do. Right? When we look for a definition of forgiveness, I also want to share with you just because um, when you uh, examine, and I, hopefully by the end of this talk, people will be inspired to do their own research, uh, and we will see that uh, for the most part, a lot of what is mentioned in the tradition, in the Islamic tradition, are either reports from the Prophet or stories from the tradition of the Muslims, and then quotations from some of the great spiritual guides. And I'm going to share with you some of those quotations today. But what I wanted to add to that are some practical aspects of how to begin a process of forgiving. And so I want to start that, I'll start out with a definition. 
Okay, and I'm going to share with you the definition of uh, Dr. Joanna North, who's a philosopher and uh, an educator, and she states that forgiveness is when unjustly hurt by another, we forgive when we overcome the resentment towards the offender, not by denying our right to the resentment, but instead by trying to offer the wrongdoer compassion, benevolence, and love. As we give these, we as forgivers realize that the offender does not necessarily have the right to eat such gifts. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. So we're going to take that definition and we're going to look at it, and we're going to pull from it or extract from it some key components, some key words. First of all, uh, forgiveness occurs as a result of an unjust hurt by someone else. Right? So the first thing is that there's pain that's caused by injustice. There's pain that's caused by an injustice. Right? The second thing is that there's a struggle that the person who the pain is inflicted upon that they engage in to overcome resentment. Because when someone inflicts pain upon you, when you feel pain, someone hurts you, okay, we internalize that pain. Now, the thing with forgiveness, forgiveness helps us to release the pain. But in order to release the pain, we have to engage in a struggle because the dormant pain can result in resentment. And resentment results in a desire to seek revenge. I mean, after all, this is why people go to war, people fight, nations go to war, okay? Because there's resentment and there's a, there's a desire for revenge, right? So the person who's striving to forgive has to engage in a struggle to overcome the resentment, because the anger is dormant, it's sitting there, and it's doing things to us. It's doing things psychologically, it's doing things emotionally, and it's doing things physically. And there is truth to that, whether in the hadith of the Prophet where he alluded to some of the physical harm that, that anger can cause, and then there's truth to that even in uh, medical science, where scientists have uh, told us that um, anger can result in stress, and stress can result in a physical breakdown of cells and, and, and whatnot. So that struggle is to overcome that resentment, which is that anger that's dormant. In our struggle to overcome the resentment, we acknowledge that we have a right to feel resentful. So you have a right to be angry, you have a right to be resentful. But the process of forgiveness calls us to move past that. Acknowledge our right, but then move past it. The fourth point is that we should also struggle to offer the offender the opposite of what they gave to us. Now this is where we get to the tough part. Because now, forgiveness requires that not, not only do we move past something, because you know how sometimes people will tell you, you know, get over it, or move on, man, let it go. You know, that phrase, let it go, you know, is easier said than done. Someone does something to you, you experience a bad situation, and you're, you're talking to one of your friends, confiding in one of your confidants, and you say, you know, I'm having a hard time, and they say, oh, just let it go. Get over it. Well, that's easier said than done. Because without going through the process of letting go, you can't let go. You hold on to it. And the unique thing about our, our brains is that, you know, our brain will remember. And this is another point about forgiveness that I want to make. That forgiveness is not about forgetting that something happened. Because I don't think we have the capacity to forget injury. I don't think that, I think it's a blessing that we remember pain. 
one of the reasons why it's a blessing is that as I strive to improve my, my personal piety, you know, what I know about pain, I don't want to inflict that on another human being consciously or deliberately. So, so my remembrance of pain serves as a buffer. It keeps me from, you know, hurting other people because I remember how pain felt for me. Okay, so it's not about forgetting what happened, but it's about releasing the dormant anger. And getting to the point where you can offer the offender the opposite of what they gave to you. So the offender gave you something bad, no question about it. But you exchange that bad and, and give the person something good. And just a quick story. Um, uh, there's a story in the tradition that talks about a sheikh. There was a sheikh one time. He was a very prominent sheikh, very well-loved sheikh. But, you know, every person like that has enemies and detractors. So this sheikh had his share of enemies and detractors, right? And so at one point in his career, the criticism of the sheikh, the undue and unfair and negative criticism was very intense. And so one of his students, he used to teach a lecture in the mosque every Friday. And so at one time, it got pretty intense. And so one of his students came to the lecture, where we were sitting here, and he came in, and he said, yeah, sheikh, you know, they're saying this, that, and the other about you. These people are saying all these bad things about you. So the sheikh said, okay, have a seat. And the story says that after the lecture, he told his student, come with me. And he went to his home. And when he went to his house, he put together a gift box. He put together a, a gift box that included some, some food, some edible things, that included some scents, okay, that included some fabric, that included a precious stone. He wrapped it up, and his student said, where are you going? He said, we're going to Fulan's house. We're going to this person's house. So when he went to the person's house, he asked for permission to enter the home. He said, Assalamu alaikum, person said, alaikum salam. He said, I just came by to give you this gift. Now, mind you, his student was stunned. This is the person that's slandering you, and yet you bring him a gift. Well, the sheriff was demonstrating his capacity to forgive that. You know, that's on him, that's not me. In fact, his slander, I'm repaying his slander with a gift. Now, when you think about that, you know, and I remember when I first shared this story with some people, they, they said, that's not even possible. If I knew that someone was slandering me, I would want to confront them and tell them to mind their business, keep their mouth shut, keep my name out their mouth, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but I, I, you know, I told them that the wisdom in this story is that the sheriff let the person know two things. Number one, that I know that you are, because it was an unwarranted gift. So I know that you're slandering me, but I'm not going to bother addressing that with you. Instead, I'm going to give you this gift in the hopes that you'll reflect on the symbolism. You know, so I know that you're doing it, but I'm going to let it go, and instead I want you to reflect on this gift. Okay? So there are countless stories like this that demonstrate the capacity that human beings have to move past resentment, anger, and revenge to a place where they can give, as in the definition, uh, offer the wrongdoer compassion, benevolence, and love. The last thing is that we realize that the offender doesn't have a right to such a gift. In other words, you're not a downtrodden person when you take this higher stance. You're not a person that's accepting being wronged. No, you're a person that is recognizing that this person has wronged you, but you're choosing not to engage them on their level, but to um, give them something, something to think about. Right? So these are five key components of the definition that 
we can look at and consider and they will help us to understand that forgiveness is an intricate process and it contains a lot of different uh, components and the end result being, inshallah, that we get to a place where we can forgive other people. I just want to uh, take a moment here to also provide just a small definition or slight definition of two words that are used in Arabic. Because if you were to get a dictionary and look up forgiveness in the dictionary, there are two words that you will see. One is afu, afu, and the other is ghafara, ghafara. So you know how we say Allah ghafur rahim. Ghafur Rahim. Ghafur is one of Allah's attributes and it is derived from the triliteral root Ghafara, which means to forgive in English. The other word is Afa. Afu is another one of Allah's divine attributes and um, it is derived from the triliteral root Afa, which also means to forgive. However, there's a slight difference between the two of them, okay? The word ghafara implies that when someone forgives you, let's, let's use it the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses it. When Allah says he's ghafur, this means that Allah forgives our sin and he forgives it in a way that it's totally, it, it disappears. In other words, there's a covering of the shame and the blame of sin that takes place when Allah forgives it. And when you think about it, it could have been that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would forgive a sin, but every time he forgave one of my sins, he left a marking on my body so that you would know that Allah forgave me for a sin. Wouldn't that be a bit? That would be a burden. You know, you know that movie, The Scarlet Letter? And how, you know, the women that were accused of adultery walked around with these red letters for the people, okay? Just imagine having that mark on you, as one of the poets said. Just imagine if there were evidence, there were traces of your sin from the night before, from the day before, for all to see. So the fact that Allah conceals the traces of our sin, and this is one of the reasons why it is a sin to broadcast your sin. So let's say that you commit a sin. It is a sin for you to broadcast your sin. You can't boast about your sin. It's haram for you to do that. Why is it haram? First of all, because Allah said very explicitly, He does not like broadcasting sin. Allah does not like broadcasting sin. But the other thing is that part of Allah's mercy is that He conceals your sin. So when you broadcast it, you are, it's as if you're being, you're, you're arrogance. Now, now you're adding to your sin the sin of arrogance. Because you're not grateful that Allah has concealed your sin. Right? So that's what ghafara means. It means that there's a concealment. This is a mercy from Allah. Afa, on the other hand, really, we could phrase it to mean that Allah just lets it go. He knows that we did it, He recognizes it, and He just lets it go. But both of these words are used in English, and they're translated in English as forgiveness. Uh, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are countless verses that speak about forgiveness. And they speak about forgiveness um, as uh, in, in, the, in the way that I framed it. That forgiveness is when you get to a place where you can uh, repel, the Quran talks about repelling good with evil. Uh, evil with good, I'm sorry. Evil with good. So I'm going to share with you two verses. One, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse, by way of the English translation, and those who are patient in adversity out of a longing for their sustainer's countenance. 
So Allah is talking about the virtues of the believers. And he's saying, and those who are patient in adversity. Now the Quran speaks a lot about being patient in adversity. And an adverse situation is a situation that can be a situation of conflict, a situation of pain, a situation of confusion. It causes adversity. It's a strain. It becomes a trial. Allah praises the people who are patient. And I always wonder why Allah praises the people who are patient in adversity. And it seems to me that because life is a series of tests, if, if you were to ask me for a definition of life, what is life? One of the definitions of life I would give is that life is a series of tests. Everyone is tested in life in some way. There is no life without testing. You're going to have tests. And it is really an illusion that Shaitan uses to lull people into believing that they're going to have a life without testing. And sometimes when we succumb to that illusion, we make more out of the test than it actually, than it actually is. And I don't know, I mean, all of us have experienced a situation that just, fra that just you know, frazzles you. You know, something happens. You're rushing to work five minutes, you're late, you got five minutes to get to your car, to get to work on time, and you go outside, you have a flat tire. You know, some days when that happens, you know how you just lose it? You know, I, I can't have one more thing happen Then you spill your coffee on your clothes. Right? Then you go to the mechanic or the tire shop, and there are three people ahead of you. So now you have to call your boss. You have to call your job. You know, when you detach from those things, all of those are just things that happen. And they happen to happen to me on that day. But my response is always, you know, well, why is this happening to me? What do you mean, why is this happening to you? If you think about some of the things that we say when Allah tests us, why is this happening to me? We ask questions that have really simple answers. Because you don't know the answer to, the real answer to why is it happening to you. But you know the answer that Allah tells you. Because it's supposed to happen to you. And so, I believe that when Allah praises people who are patient in adversity, he's reminding us that there's a way that, there's an attitude that we can have towards adversity. And human beings throughout time have demonstrated their capacity to handle high levels of adversity, high levels of stress, high degrees of pain, not just back in the time of the prophet. And this is something that we have to remember. See, sometimes we look at things in the Islamic context we forget that those people were human beings. And so the miracle of the deen is that throughout time, and this is another reason why we make dua for people, Allah brings forth people who demonstrate they live these virtues. So they're patient in adversity out of a longing for their sustainer's countenance and are constant in prayer. They're constant in prayer and spend on others secretly and openly. So prayer and charity, out of what we provide for them as sustenance and who repel evil with good. So he mentions this as a virtue. Someone does something to you, and you, re you return it with something good. They do something bad, you return it with good. You're not gonna get there, though, and this is what I wanna caution people. You can't jump to that. So you don't just read this in the Quran and then you say, you know what, I like the way that sounds, I'm going to be that way. And why, why can't you jump to that place? Because you still have to respect where you are. And you have to honor your, your struggle. It's a struggle. It's a struggle. It's not, it's not a place that you just end up in. Because you said, you know, today, tomorrow, 
I'm going to face adversity with patience. And when someone does something evil, I'm going to repel it with good. It's not that simple. It's a little more. And again, this is the benefit of spiritual practice. This is the benefit of spiritual practice. This is the benefit of tasawwu. This is the benefit of dua. This is the benefit of dhikr. Because it's a reforming of the soul and a disciplining of the, a, a disciplining of the soul. Right? So, he said at the end of the verse, it is those that shall find their fulfillment in the hereafter. Those are the people that really go to Jannah. The people that engage in the hard stuff. That struggle against the self. Because we're all human beings. We all have a nafs. And the nafs at its basis, in its basis sense, is the ego. And what I feel I deserve and who I think I am and what I think I am. And that's what the nafs is. And when you begin to challenge the nafs and put the nafs in its place, you have to control the nafs. You know how they say control the nafs? Don't let the nafs control you. You put the nafs in its place. Right? Then those people who engage in that struggle, they will find their fulfillment in the hereafter. So this is one verse. This is in the surah called Thunder, which is surah 13, verse 22. In another verse, Allah says, but since good and evil cannot be equal, repel evil with something that is better. This is a verse that has always intrigued me. What does Allah mean when he says, since good and evil cannot be equal? I'm going to put it to you in a real simple way. Someone slaps me in the face. I walk outside, somebody comes smack me in the face. My mind, I say, not that I'm going to smack him back, I'm going to break his face. He smacks me in the face, I'm going to break his jaw. He smacks me in the face, I'm going to break his hand. That's what, we, we, can, we can recognize this, right? Somebody mess with me and my family, I'm going to exterminate their whole tribe. Well, so what Allah is saying, I believe, is that when you try to repel evil with evil, you can never be exact. You always go overboard. Even though the injunction in the Quran, like the injunction in the Bible, like the injunction in the Torah is what? An eye for an eye. Someone pokes you in the eye, you poke them in the eye. That's the divine injunction. But the human understanding is somebody pokes me in the eye, I'm going to take their eye out. <laughs> you understand? So that says how we, so we always go, so Allah is saying to us that evil and evil, they will never balance out. Not that you can't have justice, you can't see justice. Just understand that there is no exact justice in seeking revenge, even when it's justified. There's no exactness. There's always something that's going to be off. Always, right? And therefore, good and evil cannot be equal. So he's saying that e good is better than evil. So when an evil situation, you're faced with an evil situation, repel it with something that is better. Take the higher road, in other words. And then he says, and this is one of the miraculous things, and lo, between whom and thyself was enmity may then become as though they had always been a close, true friend. So there's, there's a possibility that a person that you have enmity with can later on become a dear friend. If you repel their evil with that, this is not a guarantee, by the way. We're not speaking in absolutes. It's not a guarantee. But this is a divine promise that this is your potential. Right? This is in Surah Fusilat, which is Surah 41, verse 34. Now, just some of the commentaries that I looked at and, and, and really trying to share with you a really concrete meaning of repelling evil so that it doesn't sound like 
some book stuff, some theory stuff, right? And, and, and for you to understand that the words mean exactly what they sound like, right? So, uh, it is asserted by some in the commentaries that repelling evil, specifically in this verse, and this is something for the Muslims to reflect on today, right? The verse that I just quoted, repel was something that is better. This verse is referring specifically to scurrilous objections to and hostile criticisms of the Quran. So this is what we call Sad al Nuzul. The verse was revealed because, as we know, when the Prophet peace be upon him had the Quran and he took it to people, the Quran was criticized, he was criticized, he was attacked, people ridiculed the Quran, and Allah revealed this verse specifically to say, don't respond in kind. If they ridicule the Quran, don't ridicule their idols. Even though the idea of worshiping an, an actual idol is ridiculous, don't ridicule their practice, because that's their belief, and they hold it dear, and they cherish it. So don't repay them with ridicule. No, take the higher road. That's what this verse was revealed to or for specifically. And the lesson that we can learn today is, when someone ridicules the Quran, we don't have to always respond emotionally. If you recall last year or a few years ago, when people were, and people still do it, making fun of the Prophet وسلم, and calling the Prophet names, and attacking his character, and disparaging his character. And some of the Muslims wanted to burn down a whole city, <laughs> you know, because we have to defend the Sunnah. Well, we don't have to defend the Sunnah that way. If we, the best way to defend the Sunnah of the Prophet is by living it by embodying it to the best of our ability, not by responding to attacks by Islam's critics. You know, not by emotionally, you know, someone says something about the Qur'an, is that going to take away from the truth of the Qur'an? Is the Qur'an going to all of a sudden no longer be guidance? Is Prophet Muhammad وسلم, no longer going to be the best of mankind? No. Don't we think that people during the time of the messenger, didn't they attack him personally? Forget now, during his time, they attacked him personally. And even then, some of his companions wanted to emotionally respond, and he stopped them. People like Omar, people like Sayyidina Hamza, they wanted to retaliate, and he said no. Okay, so we don't have to always give in kind, right? But in a broader context, this verse can also imply that whenever one encounters evil, they should repel it with good. And this view has a lot of supporters, and I'm gonna share with you the statements of two people. One is a companion of the companion of the Lord and Abbas, who said that they restrain themselves when angry. They show forbearance when encountering ignorance, and they show forgiveness when they are wrong. He said that this verse means just that. Those three things. They restrain themselves when they're angry, they show forbearance when they encounter ignorance, and they forgive when they are wrong. And then another of the tabi'in, his name is Al-Hassan al-Basri, and he's actually one of the imams of the tabi'in, and one of the first people to began to espouse uh, uh, tasawwuf teachings, spiritual teachings. al Hassan al-Basri, he said, when they are deprived of anything, they give. And when they are wronged, they forgive. Now all of these, both of these uh, uh, gentlemen are of course extracting their understanding both from the Quran as well as their observation of how the Prophet actually was. And probably that more than their understanding of the Quran. Because the words are not really that difficult to process and understand. But they really saw the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, live this way. And so now I'm going to share with you a few uh, hadith and stories from the tradition to sort of crystallize this. Because, you know, we always want to remember that 
the Prophet was a messenger, but he was also a human being. And so anything that was in his capacity as a human being to do is, with, is within our capacity as human beings to emulate or to strive to do. And I wanted to make a point of clarity as well. Forgiving is not wajib, just so you don't think that it's something that if someone does something to you, you have to forgive them. No. It's not wajib. It's encourageable. It's a virtue. It's a highly encouraged virtue. It is something that you should strive to do even though you don't have to do it. And I hope that, that difference I was clear. That just because you don't have to do it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to do it. You understand what I'm saying? So it's not wajib. And so people shouldn't be faulted. You shouldn't feel guilty. It's not a blameworthy thing if you can't forgive at this point in time. But that does not mean, particularly after we hear guidance from Allah and teachings from the Prophet Sallallahu that we should not strive, that we should not dig within ourselves. Because that's the essence when you start talking about curing the heart. The essence of that is digging within yourself and struggling against yourself. And the thing that you find hardest to do is probably the thing that you should be focusing on. Right? So first of all, Sayyida Aisha, radiallahu anha. Who was she? Who was Sayyida Aisha? Umar she was the Prophet's wife, right? So something that she says, certainly we, we would take it, right? And, and adhere to it, right? She said that the Prophet وسلم, never took revenge on his own behalf on anyone. Right? Just think about that for a moment. He never took revenge on his own behalf on anyone. Never. Okay, so uh, Imam Anwar, what about the times when the non-believers, wasn't there a time in Mecca when they did such and such to the Muslims and the Prophet dispatched an army or he did this or he did that? Yes, that's true. But that wasn't revenge for himself. That was defending the religion. That wasn't personal. That was defending the religion. When we look at his personal life, this is a true statement, and this is why we love the Prophet One of the reasons. He never took revenge for himself. I already know I can't do that. But I know that I want to strive to get some of that. OK? Um, and so, for example, and this is just one of, uh, one of a few or some examples of his extraordinary capacity, right? So you may have heard the story of his forgiveness when he had his neighbor, who happened to be a Jewish person, and they would throw trash on his doorstep. Now I want to say this to everyone, and I want to say it on the record. I've struggled finding, to find a citation for this particular hadith. I haven't found it yet. Um, the reason that I quote it so much, and I quote this hadith a lot, and I believe it to be a hadith, is because I learned it when I was a kid, when we went to Saudi Arabia. We learned it in a reading class. The prophet and his Jewish neighbor was the name of the story. Right? And it was, we were taught that it was a hadith. But throughout my career as a scholar, I haven't been able to find this hadith anywhere. And I've searched, OK? I'm, I'm searching. And when I find it, you will know. I'll share it with everyone. But the meaning of this hadith or tradition is so profound. Because in a, in, in a nutshell, what it says is that the man with, you know, when we say a neighbor, it's not like today. Like our neighbors are right up the street. So no, the neighbor back then, if you imagine like a, a trailer park and everybody has their property, their, their little house, but some steps away. So the tent was pitched, and then for the sake of privacy, another tent, tent was pitched away from 
my tent, right? So this guy would get up, and when he was taking his trash to throw it, they would throw it in the desert. Instead of throwing it in the desert, he would take his trash and he walk by the prophet's tent and put it in front of his tent and go on about his business. And so the story says that the prophet saw his son came out of his house one day and saw there was no trash. He said, hmm, that's odd, and he kept on going. He came out another day, saw there was no trash. He said, hmm, that's odd, and kept on going. This went on for a week. Day seven, he walked up to the man's tent and called his family. Yeah, yeah, you know, where's Fulan? Oh, Fulan is sick. Oh, can I come in and see him? I mean, this is just a profound story. Just if you just think about what psychologically that person, I mean, the person I'm trashing, I'm throwing trash on his, in his path is coming to visit me to make sure I'm okay. This man has to be a prophet. He has to be a prophet. And, and so that story says that the man took shahada. Um, if you try to find this story, you're going to find uh, some people authenticate it, some people say it's not an authentic story. So, but inshallah, I'm going to uh, investigate and try to find uh, the actual uh, uh, reference uh, place for this story. Another uh, example is his encounter with the people of Taif. We all know this story. He went to Taif. He was new with the message. He was frustrated with the people of Mecca. So he said, I want to go to Taif. New people, new blood. He went to Taif, and what was the response? He ran him out of town. And they sent the derelicts after him. Yeah, go get that guy. And they chased him out of town, throwing rocks, trash. He sought refuge. They found him, dumped trash on him. He kept running. They ran him out of town. The story says that Allah sent Andrew Jibril and said, if you want, if you want, Allah will destroy them right now for their treatment of you. And he said, no, I don't want my Lord to, treat them, uh, to destroy them. I pray that Allah will bring forth from their progeny someone who will worship him. So in the context of being a messenger, he had some power. I mean, if you think about the story like this, he had the, the power to say, you know what, Allah? They did get them. Get them for me. Now, yes, I like that. That sounds good. And he, he chose not to do that. Another profound story, right? The third story, even more profound than that, I think. You know, the prophet had supporters, and one of his supporters was his uncle Hamza, his favorite uncle. What happened to Hamza during the Battle of Uhud? There was a revenge killing. The Battle of Badr, Hamza killed uh, Abu Sufyan's wife, her name was Zin. He killed her father. Hamza killed her father. So she was burning up. She wanted revenge. She plotted revenge. And two years later, in the Battle of Uhud, she hired someone to kill Hamza. She, had a, she put a contract on him. She hired the person, and all their whole responsibility was was to wait for the best opportunity. And then they killed Hamza. And when, she, when, she killed, when, when Hamza was killed, she went, the story say, and, you know, this may sound strange, but when you read Arab literature, you know, the, the bloodthirstiness that is possible when people are in heightened states of revenge is, you know, uh, she, it, the story says that she went and cut out his liver. And in her rage, she bit into the liver. Like, yes, finally, blood for blood, right? So the Prophet not only saw her on the battlefield, but years later, she accepted Islam. And she was a person, she was ashamed to go to the Prophet for years. Once she became a Muslim, she was ashamed to go to the Prophet because she felt that he would not receive her well because he, she murdered his uncle. And the story says that he forgave her. 
He had feelings about that. But he forgave her. He forgave her and he asked Allah to forgive her. Okay? So that's the third story. Now, the most profound story, I think, is the story of the conquering of Mecca. Now, we all know this story because it starts with the Hijrah. It starts with the Prophet, peace be upon him, being kicked out of Mecca. And he went to Medina. And he struggled in Medina. He built the community in Medina. He fought against the people of Mecca in several encounters and several battles. And then Allah told him to go back to Mecca and he will take Mecca back. So he goes to Mecca. After years of exile, years of separation, he takes Mecca back. Right? There were people who were sworn enemies who were there in Mecca. There were people who were constant sources of harassment and conflict over the years while he was in Medina. There were heads of tribes. So Allah وسلم, he came back victorious. But he didn't come back as an imperialist. He didn't come back as an avenger. Right? Allah gave him Mecca back. In, what he say? Inna, uh, inna mubina. He gave you a great opening. When Allah's victory and the opening, that's the retaking of Mecca. So the Sahaba, of course, for them, it represented all the things I just said. Now we can get some revenge. These are the people that kicked us out of Mecca. They did this, they did that. So they went around rounding people up. We're going to get him, and then that guy, remember, that was the guy that did this. They rounded up all these people and took them to the Kaaba. They were going to have their moment. Prophet goes to, to the Kaaba, and he says to the people, O oh, people of Quraysh, what do you think I will do to you? Now, of course, they're scared. What did Malcolm say? The chickens came on the roost. They, they, the shoes on the other foot. Now they're trembling. Okay. He said, they said, hoping for a good response from him, they said, you will do good with us. You are a noble brother, son of a noble brother. Kareem ibn Kareem. You're a noble man. We expect nothing but good from you. You know how words have a way of taking on a life world? And we hope that, you know, you'll. Find it in your heart to forgive us. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Then I will say to you what Joseph said to his brothers. Now we know the story of Joseph. If you want another story in the Quran of forgiveness, that story is a story of forgiveness. Yusuf son. What did his brothers do? Name one of the things that they did. Why did they throw him down the well? What were they trying to do? Trying to get the love of their father. Right, they were trying to get the love of their father. They were jealous. But they threw him in the well because they were trying to kill him. They were trying to kill him in a way that there would be the least amount of evidence. They wanted to make it look like an accident. But he tripped. He's a kid. And we told him to walk straight. He wasn't paying attention. And he tripped and fell in the well. Then when he went home, right, what did they tell their father? Oh, he got separated from us and a wolf snatched him and ran off of him. But their intention was, based on their jealousy and seeking the love of their father, they were trying to kill Yusuf. And Yusuf knew this, even though he was a kid. He grew up in Egypt. Time went by, he became the wazir, he became the governor of Egypt. And he had an encounter with his brothers after many, many years. Sayyidina Muhammad referenced Sayyidina Yusuf. He said to the people of Quraysh, I'm going to say to you what Yusuf said to his brothers. There, let there be no blame upon you today. Be gone, you are free people. It is said and, and mentioned in many of the, the books and the commentators on, on Sira that hundreds of people took Shahada that day just by that, that gesture alone. Because they were expecting the conqueror came and he's going to get revenge on his enemies. 
He'll do that first, then those of you that want to be Muslim, I know what's on But no, he said, all of y'all are free. Can you imagine how many people became Muslim because of that? See, some people, they needed to see a demonstration from the Nebi that what he was saying was true. They needed to see it. And they, that stroke proved it to them. Right? And so uh, these are some of the examples uh, from the seerah of the Prophet that I want to share with you today. And again, I want to just remind all of us, and I'm speaking to myself as well, in this topic in particular, because you know we all have things that we struggle with, right? Um, it's important to recognize some things about forgiveness so that we don't misunderstand what, forgive, what we're actually saying. Forgiveness is not that you condone bad behavior. Bad behavior is bad behavior. And when you experience bad behavior, when you experience an injustice, you recognize that, you recognize it as that. In fact, if you don't, that may be an indication that you're sick. So for example, if a person is abused and they don't recognize that they're being abused, then they're sick because they become a part of the abuse cycle because they tolerate the abuse. So that kind of person can't say, I forgive you. Beat me again, da, 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 da. I forgive you. No, that that's can be an abusive cycle because you have to recognize the bad behavior and not condone it. Forgiveness is also not that you forget bad behavior. And you know the old saying, what does the old saying say? Forgive, but don't forget. Well, the wisdom in that saying is that it's probably impossible for you to forget if someone does something bad to you. Now, I'm not a neurologist, I'm not a scientist, but I would think it's, I know that when, when stuff, when bad things happen, I don't forget it. <laughs> I mean, you can block it out, you can try to ignore it, but you can't forget it. Well, the thing about forgiveness is that even though you don't forget it, you don't dwell on it. And then, even more than that, you don't let it control you. Because the anger can take on a life of its own and control you, control what you say, who you are, how you respond, right? So, and then forgiveness is not justifying bad behavior. You don't want to justify bad behavior. And people who do bad things should be called on their bad behavior. And that's something that's different. Now, there are countless examples of, in addition to what I mentioned, people who have been victims of abuse, victims of molestation, victims of incest, victims of, of they've had murdered relatives, and they found the capacity to forgive. I mean, I was just reading a story recently of, uh, of a brother, a Muslim brother, who was attacked after 9-11. You may have seen that story. The guy shot him. I think he shot him. Oh, he beat him up. Oh, he broke his face all up. Yeah. And the brother said he wanted to meet the guy and, and forgive him because he didn't really understand what he was doing. You know, he beat me up, but I mean, that's not stopping the sun. You know. So, and there are countless other stories. I mean, Holocaust survivors. Uh, just countless stories of people who found the capacity to forgive the perpetrators of injustice against them. And so I think that if you were to engage, if we were to engage on a journey to begin to find how we can start this process, there will be no shortage of examples, right? Um, but I want to reiterate, and I, I want to close with this, uh, that Forgiveness is not a religious obligation, so it's not wajib. So you're not incurring sin if you are upset or mad or, or, or ticked off or whatever because someone did something to you. That's not a sin. That's normal and it's permissible and it's your right. It's your right. And no one has the right to tell you that you don't have a right to be upset when someone does wrong to you. However, the counsel is 
And the encouraging that we get from the Quran is not to dwell, not to live with anger. And, and I intend to do a, another lecture on, just on anger itself, and what it can do to people and the community, to families and communities, to relationships between people. So I'm hoping that when we begin to explore this and, and, and strive to practice this, that even in our relationships with one another, husband and wife, families, you know, uh, there are a lot of adults, and I have a few friends that didn't have good childhoods. You know, dad wasn't around, a dad may not have been supportive, and in one case, dad was abusive. And it's very interesting to see 35, 40-year-old people, 45-year-old people, still carrying the emotional anger of a child. Because the, 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 the anger is not rational anger. It's like, you know, if you say the father's name, don't mention his name to me. <laughs> you know, it's not rational. Because it's anger, it's raw. And it's been dwelling in them for decades. And that's what anger can do. I mean, anger can be passed on from one generation to, that's what revenge is all about. I mean, some of y'all are young in here, but the Hatfields and the McCoys, those stories of intergenerational family feuds, you see? So there is something to be said about not living with constant anger, right? Uh, but it's not blameworthy if a person can't forgive, particularly right away. I mean, we have to remember that, as I mentioned, it's a process. And so forgiveness is a virtue that all believers should strive to practice and incorporate into their daily lives. Okay? And what will help us as Muslims is that we have a worldview. Right? So my worldview supports the notion that I should be a forgiving person. You know why? Because even if I don't get every single person that got me, so to speak, to use a vernacular, I know that Allah's gonna get them. That's our worldview, right? We don't believe that this dunya is all there is. We believe that Allah is the judge and he's gonna judge everyone. And the wrongdoers are not going to get away with their wrongdoing. And even if I don't see it, you don't see it, we don't see it, Allah sees it. And the law is going to deal with it. So that's my worldview. So I find comfort in that. I find comfort in that. Because sometimes, you know, and I, and I, I have, a, I have a, 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 an associate who went to court for a situation and the judge ruled in his favor. And you know, sometimes for some people, that's not enough. Like he really wanted to hurt the person. So the, the judge ruled in his favor, he got stuff, he, he won. But because his anger was so deeply embedded, he wanted to see the other person suffer. And that's how deep revenge can get. You might not be able to sleep. You might not be able to eat. Because you want to see the person suffer. Right? Well, my worldview informs me that you're not going to get away with, with, with so much because Allah is in charge. Right? Whereas if I have a materialistic worldview, and I think that this dunya is all there is, and it only matters what I can do to you today, tomorrow, next week, next month, well then I'll spend my time plotting and planning, you know, and the short-sightedness of this dunya, you know, coming after you, right? For something that, really, if I take it to a law, in some regards, that's even, and subhanAllah, I forgot to mention that, Part of forgiveness is praying for people. Part of seeking revenge is praying against people. You have the power to pray against someone, but I advise you to use that very, very, very carefully. Because those prayers, Allah tends to answer them. And when he answers them, I don't know if you can really live with what Allah might do. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking no spooky stuff. I mean, really, there are people who can make dua, and when they make dua, Allah will answer that prayer. But if I make a dua against someone, I might not be able to live with 
the manifestation of what I pray for. You know how sometimes you pray for something good and then you get it and you really can't handle it because it's not what you thought it would be? The opposite is true. Right? So we have to be careful. So, but that's a power that you have. And when you forgive, you're also recognizing that I'm, not, I'm withholding from using that power that the Lord gave me. Right? But if I'm just focused on the dunya and that's all that matters, you know, this person beat me for some money, this person said something about me, I heard she was saying this about me, I heard you said this about me, uh, and even, you know, actual pain. If we're talking about pain, there's a way that if, if I'm only focused on the material part of my existence, then that's going to interfere in my ability to let, let, let it go so that I can free myself. Uh, the last thing I want to do, and then we'll wrap up and I'll take some questions, uh, is to share with you some practical steps. Um, and, of course, I can't exhaust them. And they're, they're a lecture in their, in their, on their own, in themselves. But I wanted to just sort of wrap it up with some practical things so that you can uh, envision that there are practical steps. Um, so I want to share with you uh, six things. One is... The first step is to acknowledge your anger. And as I mentioned throughout the talk, you have a right to be angry. You acknowledge that. You acknowledge that you're angry. Angry. You know? Um, and alhamdulillah, we do that really well. I mean, I know men, we do that well. You see brothers there, I'll tell you, what's the matter? I'm, I'm, I'm angry, man. Why are you angry? I don't know. I'm just <laughs> So we do that pretty well. We, we're pretty good with acknowledging our anger. But... Um, that's just one step in the process. The next step is to confront the depth of your anger. How deep does this anger run? How deep does this anger run? Right? You confront it. Sometimes that's scary. That's scary. It's scary to confront the depth of your anger. Why? Because in your angry state, someone that did wrong to you you may think, well, I'm going to kill them. They just did something to you. They didn't kill you. They, but, you know, so you, you might confront some ugly things. So, but you have to do that, right? The third thing is that you have to make a commitment to forgive. Not say it, you have to make a commitment to forgive. The fourth uh, thing is that you have to gain a perspective about the other person. Because... The other person, or the other whatever, you give them, you characterize them a certain way in that angry frame. And they become all evil. And the truth, even with the worst cases, no one is all evil. And so what this says is that you have to get a little more perspective, find some things out about them. This is true about even some of the worst people in history. If you go back to the seerah Abu Jahl, Abu Jahl was the prophet's enemy, but he was also a wealthy man, a generous man. He did things for other people, but he hated the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, in modern times, Hitler, Hitler had a life. He was a person, you know, but he did tremendous evil. So, so, you know, gaining some perspective is an attempt to humanize the person as opposed to, you know, characterizing them as in a cartoonish way, that they're just an evil person. And, um, and that's where it gets a little more difficult. Then you build positive feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. And this is all a process. And then the last thing is that you say, I forgive you. And you don't necessarily have to say it to the person in a face-to-face -face encounter, you can say it about the person and visualize saying it to them. But there's a releasing that takes place when you do that. There's a releasing that takes place. Okay? So these are uh, just some of the uh, things that are a part of the process of forgiving. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture, I wanted to, uh, in today's lecture, focus on the virtue of forgiveness from the perspective of the Islamic teachings. And inshallah, if there is a request, we can do another part of this lecture to delve more into some of the practical aspects of forgiveness. Now,
Um, we can take questions, or I have a du'a that I mentioned in the talk, which is the Prophet's Prayer, one of his favorite prayers for forgiveness. And we can um, have some copies. I don't know if I have enough, but we can uh, go over that du'a. So does anyone have any questions first? Yes? Okay, there's a question for someone who had to leave. Um, she said that um, in a personal reference, she didn't care that it was said um, that one of her children was slapped in the face mm -hmm. and the child decided to take revenge and attack the person who Did the attacking. Right. But she felt that the child, a young person, went too far because, as you said, the revenge wasn't equal. Mm -hmm. It was a slap in the face right. and a damage to the other person's mouth or something like that. Um, she wanted to know uh, one, should her, her child have walked away? And what does the child have to do? Because now, it's an excess, maybe like a sin, that this person has exceeded the bounds of what was done. Well, exceeding, well, the question is, there was a situation in which uh, someone was slapped in the face and they responded by uh, doing more than that, uh, I guess physically assaulting the person? Physically injuring. Physically injuring the person. And the question is, should they have walked away, right? Yes, and what now? Well, exceeding is always wrong. And, and let me be the first to say, I have yet to walk away from being slapped in the face. I, I haven't done it. So I'd be lying to you if I told you that that's easy to do because I know it's not. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, when we're talking about now adopting the practice of taking the higher road, part of it is subconsciously or unconsciously, I should say, we're developing our tolerance, okay? Now, there are people that I know that have practiced martial arts for years, right? And some of them have reached a level where if someone were to slap them in the face, they would walk away. They would walk away. Because number one, if they responded, their response is not gonna be equal. Because it's just, they're like a machine almost. If they're just gonna, so they walk away. So physically, it's possible to walk away. And it's encourageable to walk away. Um, but in that particular situation, I think I can sense that it was difficult, particularly if the person was a younger person and they felt humiliated or you know, disrespected, um, because uh, that's, it's a two-way thing. Um, the, if the person was older, they should know that no one has the right to disrespect another person, whether they're younger or not, and then striking in the face is an, uh, is an offense in itself. And you know, um, Muslims really take offense to being hit in the face. Uh, now I live in Saudi Arabia, I, I've seen this. Someone would rather if you hit them in the, in the stomach, you punch them in the chest, you punch them in the But there's something about slapping in the face that's degrading. It's, it's almost like, I remember a guy, uh, we were young students, and one, one student that was, two guys got in a fight and somebody slapped one of the brothers in the face. And he said, you know, he, slapped, he, would, he lost control. We restrained him, but he lost control. He said, he just blurted out. You, you slapped slaves in the face. So it's almost like his honor. And it wasn't even a really hard slap, but his honor was put in the question. So slapping people in the face is frowned upon. So, you know, it's really hard to, I would encourage that there be some type of, oh, and I forgot to mention this. Forgiveness does not mean that you have to reconcile. Okay, because forgiveness is one thing, reconciling is another process. Reconciling means that you face the person that wronged you. That's another level of forgiveness so that you may be able to say to them, to their face, in spite of the fact that you wrong me, I forgive you. 
that's an even higher level, right? So the forgiveness that we talked about today is what you can personally do. And so um, in the context of what we talked about today, um, maybe there was you know, a, a letter, you can write a letter or a phone call. Someone needs to apologize. I don't know what the impetus was for the slap in the first place. Usually that's where the problem starts. And uh, because after that, the, the, the person that received the slap was responding and they may not have responded in the best way. But you know, usually it starts with why was the, you know, the person slapped in the first place. Yes. She has to do something because she knows she physically injured the person. She should do something. Um, it would be hard to say that in this context because you know that would, in a best case scenario, be put, put, be put forth for some type of arbitration. You know, so but she should, she should do something. I mean, if somebody slapped me and then I put them in intensive care, I mean, I feel good for a couple of hours and then guilt will kick in. I go, man, it, it didn't warrant all of that. You know, so she should do something. Anyone else? <coughs> yes, sir. What about um, forgiveness as far as like a population point of view? Like, um, right. for instance, like victims of war. Very good. Or, um, you know, war, even African Americans. Yes. In the civil rights movement, or, you know, and maybe if that, those things that were done in some form or another continue to. Right. Yeah, well, again, I want to uh, reiterate that forgiveness does not mean the lack of justice, nor does it mean that we can't pursue justice. It just means that our practice will be guided, our attitude about how we pursue justice will be uh, uh, a certain attitude. So um, I think that personally, and I'm, that's a very good question. I think that as indi individually, I don't have any evidence from sociology or anthropology for what I'm about to say, but I just believe that there is an inherent anger that we inherit as African American people or oppressed people, people who have suffered oppression, not just African American people, but people in general. My brother mentioned, you know, victims of of, of crimes, of victims of slavery, or those other war. And war. You know, I believe that that's passed on. I, I don't want to say genetically because I don't have any scientific evidence, but I believe that the collective consciousness of the people, they just don't forget it. And part of them not forgetting it means that it's passed on in their tradition, in their speech. And so there has to be a separation between the, the anger which you know, informs the revenge, which then informs actions that may not be in our best interest versus the pursuit of justice according to, in our case, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophets are and some of them teach us, right? And so it's, it's a delicate thing, but I think that for the, the health of the community, it's because of the incapacitating uh, power of anger for the community to have a releasing, you know, families, you know, to, because you can't really move from where you are in a state of anger. If you're just angry, then that's just a, a neutral state. But if your anger becomes the impetus for positive work, then that's, you know, what you, how you want to begin to uh, channel your anger. You know, you don't want, because I kept saying in the talk, about the anger being dormant. That's what you don't want. You don't want that anger that's just there and it's negative. You want positive energy. You don't want negative energy. Uh, and at the same time, the same thing for that applies to individuals, applies to nations. Case in point, if you look at the United States right now, 9-11, uh, and the so-called perpetrators of 9-11, we're in two or three countries, we've got four or five covert wars, and two overt wars, and hundreds of thousands of people have died, and 3,100, I'm not diminishing that 3,100 people died on 9-11, but how many people have died in Iraq alone last month? 
you know, in Afghanistan. So, you know, there's a responsibility, particularly because another aspect of forgiveness is that sometimes you're not a victim. Sometimes you may be a victim of an injustice, but you have within your capacity to do something about it. Some people are oppressed, they can't do anything about the injustice. Other people are empowered and they can do something about it and they choose not to. So in the case of a nation <coughs> that has the power to do something about a wrong, to inflict more wrong, it's just not some, it's something's not in balance with that. And so, you know, as, as community members, as families, there is something to be said for the health of our family, the well-being of our families, and teaching our kids and practicing forgiveness because, you know, we all know this because we were young. You grow up, you grow up with issues. You got issues with dad, issues with mom, issues with this teacher, that one, this one. And at some, at some point, this, what was said today, will have some relevance in our life because we all have things that we carry with us. And so, you know, to release ourselves from that so that we can move on, so that we can let it go, so that we can grow, I think it's a, a spiritually beneficial thing. Well, Jazakallah I think that was a very good question. Yes, ma'am. Um, can or should you make so loud? Ooh, that's keeping it real. I mean, I don't think you should. You can. The question was, can you make salah behind someone that you're angry with? Uh, and I said, I don't think you should, even though you can. You understand what I mean? It's permissible. But why, why, why shouldn't you make salah behind someone that you're angry with? Because it's a distraction. It really, I mean, when you think about it, you know, you're in Salah. If you're like me, and I have the attention span of a, <laughs> when it comes to the for sure, in Salah, I'm ashamed. It's, it's all kinds of stuff that goes through, you know. That's just how that brain works. So if it's somebody that I, I have a problem with, that's definitely going to interfere with my prayer. Um, you know, I would hope that in time I would get over that, you know, but it's a, it's a real situation, you know. Um, of course, everything is in, within a particular context. So if a wife is upset with her husband, or the husband with his wife, you know, everything's, you know, it's, it's permissible even like, okay, I'm not going to pray with you. I'm not going to make a shower with you tonight, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm upset. That's okay to do. You know, it's not, but it's not a good practice to continue. Yes? If you have rancor or anger within you, yes. will, you be, will you be permitted to tell that? If you have rancor or if anger? You have anger, if you have that much anger against a person, right. or it's so deep in you, will you be permitted to enter the next time? That, I, I, Allah knows best. If you, the question was, if you have rancor or anger in you, right, deeply in you, will you be permitted to go to paradise? And that, that's, um, it's possible that you can go to paradise because, well, rancor, I don't know. That's, I mean, rancor is not a disqualifier from paradise, so um, I would think that if you acted on it, I think that the harm that comes from deeply embedded anger and rancor is more self-inflicted harm. You know, and it, because not only, as I mentioned in the beginning, it can harm you emotionally, physically, psychologically, anger can do that to you. Anger can drive you mad. Particularly if you can't do anything about the focus of your anger, you can go crazy, right? But also, it's sort of like it holds you back from the good that you could receive, you know? So there's something that's to be said about benevolence. There's something to be said about compassion. There's something to be said about love. But rancor and anger, uh, rancor and love can't 
coexist. They're just two opposing elements. They're like fire and water. You know, either the fire is going to dry out the water or the water is going to burn out, put out the fire. You know, they can't coexist. You can't have rancor and love. They don't go together. Anyone else? Okay, we're going to um, take a moment now just to, did everyone get a copy of the du'a? And uh, I'm sure that we're familiar with it, but I just wanted to um, uh, get the baraka of, because this is one of the prophet's favorite du'as, Salamah and Salamah. I wanted to get the baraka of, of saying this du'a a few times. So uh, this du'a is the one he used to love to say following every salah, particularly during Ramadan. And if you notice, during the night prayer, we say it during the, the, uh, the uh, winter. And basically, the du'a translated says, O oh Lord, verily you are, you are, that should be, you are the pardoner. And you love pardoning, so pardon us. And that's the word I was talking about early, afuwun. Afuwun, which is the word that we said means to just let it go, as if it never happened. Right? So we're going to, I'm going to say it, and you uh, repeat it after me. And part of this is, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, Dua, the Adhan, the Iqama, Qur'an, all of these things in our tradition are transmitted by uh, Isnad and Ijazah. So it's always a good practice if you have someone who's qualified to teach you a few words that you receive from them. Because that, in a way, puts you as a part of the, the, the Isnad. Okay? So, Allahumma. 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 Allah. Innaka Innaka Afuun Afuun Tuhibbu Tuhibbu Al-Afwa Al-Afwa Fa'fu Fa'fu Anna Anna Now of course Anna means us If you want to say me You say what? Anni Anni Right Allahumma Allahumma Innaka Afuun Tuhibbu Al-Afwa Fa'fu 